Um, hi everyone, my name is Eki Veltheim. I'm one of the artistic associates of Chambermaid Opera. Um, and this is Byron Scullin, who is a sound engineer, sound designer, sound artist, composer, all around good guy. Um, <laughs> the main point of us talking today is um, about this specific project called And Other Other, which was a, a CMO production that we performed this year at the Meat Market and in 2014 at Castle Mains Punctum. Um, and I was one of the creators of that, along with um, Sabina Maselli, who's a visual artist, and composer performers Anthony Pateras and Natasha Anderson. Um, and Byron Scarlin was a kind of essential part of that collaboration too, as a um, as a go-to guy with the sound design, with the specialization aspects and, and all other sorts of audiovisual stuff, um, which there was, was quite a bit. Um, for those who haven't seen the show, I'll just quickly introduce the idea behind it and what we did. Um, it was based on a famous Ingmar Bergman film called Persona from 1966. Um, and our idea was to not do an, an, uh, a kind of an adaptation of it, a staging of it, but rather we used that original film as a kind of springboard for a completely new work, um, which kind of looked at the same themes as that film was dealing with. Um, and one of those themes is this kind of, uh, for those of you who don't know the film, it's, it's got two main female characters. There's a there's a nurse called Alma, and then there's an actress called Elizabeth. And Elizabeth Fogler um, has lost her voice in the middle of uh, a performance of Electra, the play. And Alma, the nurse, is, uh, is in charge of her recuperation um, in a, a private um, beach house shack that uh, Elizabeth's doctor owns. Um, and then the movie is, is kind of about this um, uh, is this uh, becomes kind of a psychological thriller about um, the merging of their characters, uh, about the way this this naive young nurse, uh, who's kind of incorporated all these manufactured empathies that that Greg was talking about, and is is kind of a personification of those. How she comes into contact with this this actor or actress who's meant to be an expert of empathy, I guess, or, or, or taking on different personas, but uh, seems to have kind of lost her soul in the process. Alma, of course, means soul, which is no coincidence, I'm sure. Um, so then there's this kind of uh, process of, of, of the silent Elizabeth uh, kind of eavesdropping on Alma's um, personal thoughts as she kind of... Uh, She's a chatterbox and can't stop talking. And because there's no response from from uh, Elizabeth, who is, is kind of in a in a mother relationship, um, Alma tries her best to fill that void of silence. So there's you know in a way, in a funny way, it kind of relates to some of those things that Greg was talking about. Um, enough about persona. The way that we we um, in a kind of formal way decided to. Um, interpret the, the film um, was that we used the structure of the film in a very one-to-one um, -one correspondence where we, we kind of, uh, uh, the length of our performance was exactly the same as the film and we, we uh, used the kind of the edit cuts of the film for the structure of our performance, which is a very unusual way for, for musicians to work um, and an interesting challenge. Um, in terms of the spatialization, um, we had a 12 speaker matrix set up. Um, this is a, just a kind of a stage, staging shot from, from Meat Market. So we had 12 speakers around the space and we had four video projections um, going as well. So we had, we had two video projections in the, in the middle with these trans, translucent scrims and then, then two um, solid screens at, at the back. And, and uh, the audience sat uh, in two um, seating banks facing each other and the performers were in between these two uh, transparent screens. 
So there was this idea of, of mirroring, and I'll talk about that um, a bit more in a second. Um, just a couple of other shots of the, of the space. This is how the projections kind of worked um, in the space. And here's a kind of uh, schematic diagram of, of the um, layout. Um, so here we see that the black, black circles in the middle, that's the performers. Um, and then you see the, the vertical lines there, the, the streams um, or streams. And then we've got a bunch of speakers. So each screen kind of has its own speaker um, pair. And then we've got these things called, which we call the ghetto blasters around, which were meant to be kind of this saturated sound that came uh, out of the, the darkness in the room. Um, one major point in the film that kind of really uh, informed the specialis specialization aspect, both visually and, and uh, sonically, uh, is, a, is a section that we call the double narrative, which is where there's a, uh, there's a very long sequence, about four and a half minutes or five minutes long, uh, where Alma thinks that she's finally cracked Elizabeth's sort of psychological veneer. So, so Alma um, is directing this, this monologue at Elizabeth, telling Elizabeth that, that um, she's in this uh, kind of uh, speechless condition because she couldn't love her child. So uh, it's, it's this kind of pop psychology coming on in a way. So what Bergman does is he, he uh, shows us that that scene from one direction, like from as the camera being behind Alma's back uh, with Elizabeth's face. And then he does a, a pretty radical thing and, and, then, and does the same scene, the same five minutes from the other perspective, from behind Elizabeth's back on Alma's face. So, it's, so the whole sequence is, is 10, 11 minutes, which is a big chunk of a seven, nine, nine minute movie. Um, so it's a very pivotal moment, and it's it's this, and it kind of shows this mirroring idea in the film, this mirroring and fusing, and and this kind of the geomet geometry of it of it all as well. So that was a really that was that informed our idea about the specialization of 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 the vision and the sound in the piece, where a lot of the time we were playing with these ideas of of reflection, mirroring, and fusing um, between the different kind of uh, between the the different elements of the of the matrix, um, and also between the, the live playing versus pre-recorded material. So I thought, you know, uh, seeing as it's a it is a, a musical piece, um, I should play you a little bit um, just to give you an idea of, of the sound world. Uh, this is about a four minute <coughs> excerpt. I thought, you know, to have a, a sort of chunky excerpt that demonstrates. It, this demonstrates the the is is a fragment of our the middle of our double narrative. So we'll hear two minutes of of uh, like the camera being on on Elizabeth's face and two minutes on Alma's face, so to speak. Um, and hopefully it'll come out in the specialization. We're using a an eight speaker matrix here, um, so we don't have the full tw twelve speakers that we had in the room, but the eight speakers <coughs> give a really good. Um, sense of, of that idea. 
so yeah, hopefully that communicates that, you know, with some clarity, this kind of sudden shifting of all the elements across this kind of diagonal axis where the, where the, um, the bass drum sort of depth charges are on one side in one and on the other side in, in the other and the live instruments swap as well. Um, it's probably a good idea now to introduce Byron into the mix now that I've kind of given basic idea of how the, how the piece evolved and how we conceptualized the, the spatialization to be a really kind of integral part of the composition of the, of the piece and not just a kind of afterthought or, you know, let's get some surround sound happening because it's sexier. Um, <laughs> speaking of sexy, <laughs> Mr. Byron Scarlin. Uh, okay, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> great. Uh, so, uh, I guess in order to begin to talk about um, what we ended up doing with another other, uh, just to provide a bit of context, I might just talk, uh, try and encapsulate briefly just a bit about contemporary practice when it comes to talking about spatialization and just methods of spatialization. Um, so, uh, in, in many ways, with another other, what we're looking at here is a fusion of like basically two different styles of spatialization. Um, this kind of categorization is something that's kind of well, uh, it's something that exists, and I think other people that work in spatial sound can probably recognise what I'm talking about. I don't know if it's something that's sort of more officially or from a research point of view kind of documented. And that is this, there's two different conventions, I would, I would, I would say two different conventions and, and space between those two different conventions where spatialization moves between. And that is uh, one that's fundamentally directed towards screen practice and the cinema and cinematic conventions of spatialization. And then probably the more abstracted forms of spatialization that kind of uh, come out of the uh, avant-garde uh, in the post-Second World War period, so electroacoustic music from Germany and the music concrete from France, and just about how uh, artists working in those areas thought about using speakers in space uh, and how they articulate their work spatially. Um, so uh, with cinema, we have a very much this convention of um, and it kind of begins with Alan Blumlein's early research into stereophony uh, back in the 1930s and the actual stereo system. Uh, that with stereo, what we're trying to do is to project a second acoustic space onto a primary acoustic space. So every room has its own fundamental acoustic environment that we're in. So the reverb time in this room, for example, and the architecture of the space determine the way that the room behaves spatially uh, and the way that we uh, perceive that room spatially. When it comes to uh, stereo and uh, from beyond stereo, uh, there is a slight schism between, say, like our practice of ambisonics, which is probably more a pure form of spatial representation based upon Blumlein's um, like research and methodology, and then that sort of skewing off a little bit to do with cinema uh, and, and, and the invention of the talkies and so on and so forth. That we are trying to sort of superimpose a second acoustic onto that primary acoustic. So in order to kind of create this feeling of suspension of disbelief that when we're in the cinema, that we want to feel like that we're not sitting in a deadened room, that we are out in an open field, that we're out in the middle of <coughs> space, that we're on wherever, you know. So wherever the screen wants to take us, that spatially that the sound goes with that and that we're creating this kind of illusory <coughs> sort of uh, environment uh, to enhance that sense of whatever's going on inside the screen. And it's very much to do with a lot of, um, there's, a, there's a lot of prerequisites that need to be met uh, in terms of all of these systems of both stereo and then if we talk about industrial cinema like, you know, 5.1, 7.1, so the Dolby kind of like spatialization systems through to like Dolby Atmos and stuff that exists now, that they first of all require like forward orientation. They require a certain plane to be met in terms of the leveling of the speakers. The orientation of the speakers is very specific. The balance of the speakers in terms of the dynamic range and the responsibility of those speakers. So when we see the THX trailer at the start of a movie, what that actually indicates is that the cinema has been calibrated to a standard. THX is a standard of, of, of cinema calibration. And so all of these trailers, as well as being kind of great moments to show off the spatial sound system and the visuals to some extent, are actually also indicators of that standard being met in those spaces. And when I say industrial, I mean it's all about repeatability. It's all about this ability to take a spatialization in a mix from a cinema 
and disseminate it out through cinema systems and for everybody to have consistently the same experience of that spatialization. And that extends into the home now with 5.1 and people putting home cinema systems in. And, you know, uh, believe it or not, like I think a lot of people that do have surround sound systems, even people that have stereo systems in their house, aren't aware of like the very kind of reasonably strict rules about how those speakers need to be placed in the room, how, the, how you need to be oriented towards it as a listener in order for this three-dimensional projection of sound to actually appear to be true. So quite often you go to people's houses and they've got a stereo system and like one speaker's up on a bookshelf and another one's down on the ground and there's no way that you're ever going to get a three-dimensional projection of space, the idea that the concert stage can be projected into a room with systems set up like that. So. That's one school of thought about spatialization and, and, and sound projection. But then we look to the, to, to the avant-garde and to sort of more experimental practice coming out of Europe. There's this much uh, different sense that we shouldn't try and sort of superimpose a second acoustic onto that first acoustic. We have a space that has its own acoustic, so we should place speakers with that in mind and use those acoustics in a much more abstract way, in a much less repeatable way, in a very sort of site-specific way in order to create interesting relationships um, musically and sonically and also to create an interesting performative context. So of course when we're thinking about cinema and stereo it's very much about the performance occurs in some post-production environment uh, and it's one rendering of a performance that occurs only once and it doesn't really shift. However, when you kind of look at more the sort of acousmatic kind of speaker systems, speaker orchestras uh, and various other kind of like incarnations of much more abstracted sound projection systems, it relies a lot more then on the performer actually responding to that sound in space and actually using that speaker system as a performative element, as an instrument. So that uh, depending, the piece might, the, the actual content, the material that's projected through that system might remain the same. But because we move into different spaces and because the speaker systems change and because this, the position of all the speaker systems change, those performances can shift quite radically in terms of their realisation in terms of the spatiality. So that in one room you might experience a section of a piece occurring in one element of the space. You take the exact same material but through different speakers and in a different acoustic and it occurs quite differently just because of the uh, complex acoustic effects that occur and rather than trying to sort of like dominate them or to control them it's much more a, a case of like reveling in them and using them to like maximum advantage. So when we come to work on a piece like Another Other we have this sort of fusion between the work is sort of pulling on cinematic conventions like the work itself formally has a cinematic structure to it the piece is, is, is pretty much strictly based on the editing in Bergman's film in terms of the formal uh, construction of the piece. And also we're, we're still involving the screen here in terms of the way the audience perceives the work and so there is still this forward facing, front facing idea of like looking at the screen and seeing things occur. But of course it's important to point out that with this illustration that the audience faces inwards on both sides. So the idea that in cinema or in stereo is that, the f that everybody faces the same direction, everybody faces forward, we can't really deal with that in this context. So the idea of doing something more formal from a sort of 5.1 stereophonic kind of perspective is sort of already highly compromised because it assumes the audience looking in one direction and here of course we have the audience both facing inwards if these speakers were to project stereo and they're not even in the correct position, like these angles are far too acute for that to work, but if it was to project stereo into this space, all the reflections would mean that this audience isn't going to hear just the stereo and the reflections that occur because of that. They're going to hear all the resultant activity that's going on here. And so therefore as a spatialization and trying to sort of think about, as artists trying to think about how might we work with that, how might we have some sort of sense of control or some sort of sense of artistic agency within how the spatialization works, it it's becomes highly compromised. Like there really isn't any sense of control in, in just using stereo in this thing. There's a whole lot of redundant effects that in the kind of more electroacoustic format you would take advantage of. So it seemed that in this piece and in terms of just the conventions, the compositional conventions and I guess to some extent to the stylistic sources that Icky and Sabina and Anthony and Natasha were looking to draw upon in terms of creating the work, that we needed to go f towards coming up with a, with a spatial design 
that probably drew more much more on that sense of like abstraction that sense of uh, that every space that we go into uh, we work with the sound system uh, as it is in the room acoustically and that the piece therefore has to be attuned to each room that it goes into so from the first development that we did in Punctum, which is basically the old Castle Main uh, Hospital is now a sort of shared space that the uh, council, I think, uh, the local council occupy. And so Punctum is like a subterranean, like it's an old storeroom, it's right underneath the uh, hospital. It's this very low ceiling, uh, concrete floors, concrete columns. Uh, there was a big kind of like exposed piece of the, the dirt underneath the foundation of the building at one end. And so it's acoustically from the point of view of like trying to project a realistic image in there, it's incredibly compromised. Like when we walk into a cinema, we walk into an absolutely dead space. When we walk into a recording studio or a mastering suite, that room is, is the architecture and the interior design of the room is specifically designed to best utilize like that stereophonic projection or that surround sound 5.1, 7.1 projection. So there's no way that even that the room is going to even allow allow for that. So we have to work with it. But that room has its own responses, like it has its own acoustics, it has its own certain frequencies that build up because of the nature of the way the room works. So therefore, when we set up the sound system and uh, and, and also just the, the, the nature of this design is that Eki and the performers have to attune the piece to this room. So they have to take the material and then consider how that it's going to work in this space and make adjustments for that work. Then when we move to the meat market, it's a completely different, like a radically different space. So high vaulted ceilings, much, much larger acoustic, uh, larger audience number two. So there's a whole lot of variables that are shifting there. But as performers, there's a whole lot of work and effort and rehearsal that still goes into ensuring some consistency in the performance both for the satisfaction of the performers to see the work realised the way they believe it should be worked, but also for the audience to feel that there's not just, that the things are still like, um, that at least the audience are being carried through the performance by the performers and by the assurity of the performers. So it's very important that even though we're dealing with something that's very abstract and the rooms are shifting, that we still try and find some level of consistency between <coughs> both those rooms and we can talk a bit about how that actually works. But also too with this design and largely like in, in many ways the piece, I mean would I be right in saying the piece like has is a highly like metaphorical, like there's a lot of metaphorical aspect to the way the piece works in terms of this thing of like interior and exterior. Yeah, for like sure. this yeah. idea of like that within persona that it's the work is highly psychological so there is very much this sense of like that division between our interior subconscious life, our exterior, external life. And then in many ways, the embodiment of the spatialization is trying to sort of like play on that idea in that the performers sit at the center of this work and the, and the work, once it goes, is, is autonomous. There's no audio operators, there's no lighting operators. It, the, the performers drive the piece. So that in many ways that the performers sit at the center of the piece, but we have this sort of interior sort of space here and this exterior, but also too, Eki was talking about this thing that we, in the shorthand way, talk about the ghetto blasters, which are speakers that lie right to the very, very exterior of the space. And this is almost like the additional exterior, so that at times if we wanted to feel, the, feel that both the audience and the performers were encapsulated in this interior environment, that there was still another layer of, of ex external space outside that again. And for us, just to interject quickly, yeah, okay. the. Uh, to sort of accent accentuate that, there's not only this kind of uh, two-dimensional spatialization. There's al also the third thing of of uh, well, it, there's there's one of the quality of the speakers. So we actually wanted the, the ghetto blasters to be a much poorer quality. That's why they're called the ghetto blasters. We wanted them to be something that that kind of just existed uh, beyond this external world. And for us, that was kind of Metaphorically, that was the realm of the sublime, which is kind of hinted at in the film uh, as, a, as a kind of the, the dead nature that you can't actually have a, have, you know, almost like a romantic 19th century idea of nature as this sublime that you can't actually have a relationship with, that you can't actually uh, contain as an aesthetic, uh, as aesthetically you can't contain it under a concept. So then, then the, the in internal um, quad uh, which faced the audience, uh, 
they were on stands on the ground and they were they were all matched as as four match speakers and then the, the outer quad uh, were another set of four match speakers but they were flown from the, the lighting rig uh, angled downwards um, uh, towards the audience again so they and and then the the ghetto blasters so to speak they were a much lower quality speaker that we also filtered in a way or used filtering um, in a way to kind of make them even more tinny, um, a bit like this, you know, uh, the in utero sound, I suppose. Yeah. Um, not that we were aiming for that, but, you know, there's an interesting uh, parallel. I'm grasping at these parallels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were, like, in, in the meat market, they were hidden uh, inside these alcoves, uh, which, if you know the meat market, there's these alcoves where, where they used to sell the, the produce from. So they were hidden there, and they were facing out, outwards, and they were on the ground. Um, so, you know, there were uh, kind of several levels of, of sound quality and spatialization at the work to, to work with this metaphor that Byron was talking about. And, and another interesting part about this as well, and, a, and just in terms of like talking about the, the difference between these sort of two conventions of spatialization and how they sort of meld together in this work, is that when we talk about the stereophonic, stereophonic sound and we talk about um, cinematic 5.1 sound, th th there is still that theatrical proscenium arch. It's invisible, but it exists. So the idea that the performers are presented in front of you, there is a proscenium arch, there's this invisible dividing line, and then you as the audience perceive that on the other end. So there is that sort of uh, much more hierarchical kind of layout, I guess, in some ways, of like how that exists. Whereas, of course, in this, it's completely sort of like twisted and, and turned back in on itself. So that the performers uh, aren't, and, and, in, and in many ways, when we look at like how um, sound systems are articulated, when we talk about that proscenium arch, you know, when you go to see a concert or whatever in stereo, like you hear one PA, but then of course there's all these stage monitors and all this other additional sound reinforcement that's all completely catered for the performers on stage and they have, have their own monitoring that is much more specific and specialised based on each performer and whatever else rather than what the audience hear, which is generalised sound. And anyone that's performed on stage realises that that the performer's experience of a piece is radically different to the audience's experience of a piece pretty much all the time. Whereas in this piece here, the actual performers occupy in many ways the sweet spot of the room in some ways because they lie at the centre of all of this sound. And when it comes to sort of calibrating and balancing the sound, we do take this centre point as, as, as a place to be. There is some referencing to the centre of the audience areas as well, but in many ways, we're trying to sort of provide this sort of very, it's hard to say consistent, but that at least in some ways there is some parity between what the performers experience and what the audience experience, but that in fact the room and the piece operate as a, as a, as a whole, whole, whole entire thing. So that even though each person in their audience position is unique, that the entire system operates as a whole functioning thing, but with the performers actually occupying the center of it. And it's a little bit like there are, you know, there are other conventions like this. I think probably the the famous kind of popular music one is that the Grateful Dead for a long time performed in front of their PA. So they actually had a humongous concert-sized PA when they're performing to these huge audiences, but they perform in front of it. And that was largely due to the genius of um, of uh, John Mayer, who now makes uh, is the head designer of Mayer Sound Systems. And, and a very, very careful, careful of phase alignment of the microphones in relation to the speakers to not cause feedback to occur because normally that would be disastrous from any other point of view of being able to do that. And in many ways, the benefit of contemporary technology and the digitalization of so much audio equipment means that we can still place the audiences, the performers at the center of something like this, still retain a very high level of fidelity, a very high level of dynamic range without having that feedback enter into it. So Eki's got a microphone on his, his violin, you playing this one, and then uh, Natasha has a contrabass uh, uh, clarinet. Recorder. Oh, sorry, recorder. Sorry, my bad. And and then Anthony, of course, is doing live processing using an old Revox uh, real real tape machine. So a lot of the processing here of the instruments that's happening is happening in real time with Eki doing the performance. So again, it's one thing to do spatializations where we're just doing playback material and, and in a context like this, but then it's a very different thing to incorporate that those live sources into that without causing sort of other interruptions and issues. Um, and so I think it's probably a good point to play this yeah, example that Eki has here of like time. both the sound, the sound uh, as, it, as it occurs in the space, like a little bit of what you heard then, but then actually like what the console is putting out, like the raw dry material. So almost as if 
one is a is a capturing of the context of the meat market and then another one would be almost like a rewriting of this piece if we were to perform it in this room in some way. Can we, can we do questions afterwards? Yeah, yeah of course. course. This yeah. Thing. Yeah. So that was a live ambisonic recording of the performance of a segment. And this is the same segment, um, but as, it, as the abstract composition that is also specialized, as, as, as if, I guess, we put it into an ideal space like a cinema. Um, so I guess that gives you some sense of, um, and it all, it's free, you know, the ambisonic recordings is very much that capture of the room. It's quite, you know, distant. It's, you know, it's, it feels very, it, you can get at least the sense of contrast in terms of like what the space provides in terms of uh, another additional voice in terms of the composition against that pure output of the material that is coming out and would be projected into that space. But just to wrap it up, I think that the main thing in terms of this fusion of these ideas and designing this spatial system is it's very much about trying to give the performers and the artists like this additional instrument to perform on. That in fact the entire spatial system is again another instrument and it's an extension of like their expression. So well, that, that's the orchestration. Yeah, yeah that in many ways, yeah, in many ways is the, is the orchestration, this ability to kind of shift sound through space and to add that additional spatial element in terms of the composition, but also too, with kind of like a maximum amount of flexibility and also this ability for continuing interpretation so that the artists don't feel like that every time they step into a new space that they are just simply playing back another performance. It does really make that mean that every time this piece moves into a different space, that performance is unique and the, audi the audience is being stimulated by the fact that the artists themselves are being stimulated by the new and interesting effects that occur in every single room that it goes into. So that, that instrument is both not too complicated for them to be able to articulate their ideas, but is also at the same time, um, like comp well, not complex enough, but at least contains enough fidelity for those sounds to always kind of remain interesting in that way. Yeah. Thank you.